Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another reading with Listen with Vobes. Hello, welcome along. It's nice to see you on, uh, what day is it today? The 18th of March, 2021, four o'clock here in the UK. Might be a different time where you are, of course, um, but don't let that worry you. Apparently, some parts of America, if not all of America, have already sprung forward uh, into summertime or whatever they call it. Uh, I think we do it at the end of the month. Anyway, uh, we are reading, of course, London Belongs to Me, uh, which is a, a lovely book. Uh, we've been doing that now for, uh, this is part seven, I think, or something like that. Um, so it's all going very well. Uh, lovely Julia, hello to you. Turbo Stream, nice to see you. Zom Coco, good afternoon to you. Audrey Forbes is back. She says, I've not had any internet since Tuesday. So it's good to be back. Oh, my goodness, it feels like a, an arm has been lopped off when your internet has disappeared. Um, Haywood the Wake, good afternoon to you, Haywood. Very nice to uh, have you uh, with us. Justine Jones, Billabong O'Neill, Philip Hammond and Mary, Davey Vad, Michael White, Turbostream and Lee Lawson. Uh, got a, a hot cross bun and a nice cup of tea. I'm afraid I've only got a glass of water today. Been running around a little bit uh, today, so um, I'm not... Um, as prepared as I was, but uh, hey-ho, not to worry. Nice to see you all. Thank you very much for coming along. Uh, we're just coming up to four o'clock. We give people a, a little bit of uh, time to settle in. We are on uh, chapter nine, uh, which is called, as it happens, Interlude with Dr Otto Hapfell. I don't know if you remember Dr Otto Hapfell was the character that we were introduced very, very briefly who was writing down things, I believe, at uh, the back of the um, parliamentary sessions thing that um, Uncle Henry had taken uh, Mr Josser to. I don't actually... Do we ever know what Mr Josser's first name is? I'm just trying to think whether we actually ever find out what his name is. I think he's just Mr Josser all the way... <laughs> all the way through, which is quite interesting, isn't it? Uh, Turbo says, I have apple porridge with chaya seeds. That sounds interesting. I don't know what chaya seeds are. Um, Turbo Stream be interested in tomorrow's video, assuming it comes out. I haven't had a chance to edit it yet. I'm going to edit it this evening. Um, I had a look at another gentleman who has a uh, VW, what do you call it, um, transporter, and he's had it professionally decked out as a camper van with a rock and roll bed, as he called it, a bed that you pull out like this, but a nice professional bed, beautiful fitted cabinets um, with a fridge and a sink and, and all those things, um, chairs that swivel round like he has, um, which I believe I can do by putting a plate down. I'd need to check this out so that I could put my passenger seats on a circular plate and you can twist them round. So I need to just double check and see who could do that for me. Um, so we were chatting about and we made a video, a very brief video, so um, that uh, hopefully some people will find it interesting. I know that some people have said, oh, Richard, not another van video, that sort of thing, but you just can't please everybody all of the time. Um, and I, I need to get my van sorted so that when we have the restrictions lifted, I can bring in the Bald Explorer more of those interesting places that I know people are itching for me to go out and do. Um, Philip says, I have a slice of puff pastry inside its marzipan and stewed apple. Really yummy. Wow, I'm beginning to get hungry now. Um, uh, Jen Colley says, made it. It's a crazy day. It certainly is. Mary... I made the above. Oh, uh, Mary made it. Oh, lovely. Not only are you a brilliant knitter, um, but you're also a great chef then by the sounds of things. Uh, so that's all good. Anyway, here we go. So um, let's crack on. Just having a quick look at the, uh, at, the, at the comments just in case anybody had anything extra to add. So chapter nine, interlude with Dr. Atto Hatfell. Let's find out about this curious character. In his single bed sitting room in Coram Street, Dr. Otto Hatfell, the young man who had visited the South London Parliament, 
was writing a letter. It was a long letter, and he was taking immense pains over it, for it was no ordinary letter. He had written a weekly document of this kind ever since he'd been in England, and it had been finally, sorry, and it had finally become the very centre of his life. Even his studies were now only secondary to the importance compared with it. He spent nearly the whole week, when he was not at lectures, going to the theatre, to the football matches, to restaurants, to religious services, to public meetings, painstakingly observing the strange British race and making notes on its behaviour. It was his fervent hope, his prayer, that somehow or other he might hit on some single aspect of English life that had never been scientifically isolated before, something that might provide the essential key to the national character. On the face of it, the effort was not wasted. The recipient of these six- and seven-page letters, he was Dr Carl Anders, senior history master at the gymnasium at Crayfield, had hinted that the letters did not remain unseen by others. He had even taken the liberty of having copies made. He had shown them in the right quarters. In the result, they had gone very high. Very high. Exactly how high Dr Halfhell dared not ask, but there was a suggestion of ultimate elevation that made it possible for Dr Otto Hatfell, writing away in the rosy glow of his shilling-in-the-slot gas fire in Coram Street, to imagine that passages from his letters, certainly skilfully chosen sentences, might eventually find their way upwards and upwards until finally no less a person than the Führer himself. Uh, but this was absurd. Dr Hatfell was allowing his imagination to run away with him. And I need to just scratch my belly. At the same time, was it really absurd? If he hadn't, if it hadn't been for those letters, why should he have been invited to the embassy in Carlton House Terrace? There must have been a reason, a special and distinctive reason, something that had singled him out of all the other members of the German Students' Club who hadn't been invited. The ambassador didn't go off offering his hand to every German postgraduate who was quietly pursuing his researches in London. Heil Hitler, he began his letter. I trust that our beloved Führer enjoys good health. May he prosper. There were two perfectly valid reasons for beginning his letter in this style. In the first place, it was only fair to Dr Anders, as the envelope was sure to be opened by the postal censors as soon as it got into Germany. And secondly, he really felt that way. During the whole of his year in England... He had felt himself mysteriously supported or assisted by the divine, yes, divine was not as too strong a word for it, love and strength that emanated from one man and reached across rivers and mountains, over frontiers and continents and oceans to others of German race, no matter where they were. It was exciting, like living in the birth of a religion while the saviour was still alive. Dr Hatfell gave the knob of his stylo a little twist and continued with his letter. I've, I've been to many theatres and cinemas lately, he wrote, as solemnly as before, and I thought that you might be interested to hear how the audiences behaves when the national anthem is played. It is instructive to observe the devices which are adopted to avoid the testing patience of the public too strongly. Sometimes a few bars from only an electric record uh, player are played at the beginning of the performance so that people can come in late and so avoiding it altogether. 
Many adopt this pitiful subterfuge. In other theatres and cinemas, it is played in the same shortened form at the end. But the effect is very much the same. Many leave deliberately before it. Everyone is, of course, expected to stand to attention whenever it is played, but at the end of the performance, only some high Tories observe the convention. Others button up their overcoats, feel for their gloves and reach for their umbrellas. Singing of the anthem is rarely heard except for on boat race night. The boat race, you will remember, is an intercollegiate race rowed in the tidal water of the Thames between Putney and Mort Lake. And as the British are a sea-powered nation, very much popular enthusiasm is released by this demonstration of water fitness. At religious services in those demonimations which I have attended, the anthem is not played at all. At large football matches called cup ties, the anthem is both played generally by compulsory military bands and sung, but at cricket matches it, it is rarely heard. I have been to Lord's, the principal cricket stadium in London, three times without hearing it once. Dr Haffel gave another twist of the knob of his stylo so that the ink should flow free, re really freely and he went on with a second page and with a third and with a fourth and with a fifth. And uh, with the sixth, and even with the seventh, when he had finished, he was quite exhausted, and he sat back in his chair wondering how a race like the English, which had at once been so vigorous and ruthless, could have decayed so rapidly. He thought that perhaps it had something to do with the women. English women, he had already noticed, habitually smoked in public, wore their hat short, sorry, wore their hair short, and arranged their own marriages. The clock in St Pancras Church at the bottom of Southampton Row chimed midnight, and Dr Hatful put away his writing materials in the flat, zip-fastened briefcase that he always carried about with him. When the room was tidy, he stood at attention and saluted the Führer's photograph on the mantelpiece. Then he started to undress. Michael White says, I didn't know Claude Schwab was in this book. Yeah, well, he is very much in, uh, in the book. Sounds like you can convert your chairs to swivel ones. Look forward to seeing it. Yes, I must investigate uh, swivelled chairs, along with my swivelled eye. We are now on chapter 10, ladies and gentlemen. Mr and Mrs Josser were sitting facing each other. Mr Josser, his waistcoat undone and his feet up on the fender, was the more placid figure of the two. Spread out on his knees was a copy of the Home Finder and he was buying cottages. One after another, he marked them down. A delightful, secluded cottage residence, old world garden, main water, mile from the bus service. Genuine Elizabethan snip, five good rooms, 15th century well in the garden. For lovers of the antique situation, outskirts, small country town, thatched barn, uh, converted into labour-saving pied-à-terre, and the list grew and Mr Josser went on buying. The matter of the price was a difficulty, of course. All the cottages that he seemed to like uh, seemed to cost uh, between five and six hundred pounds, and Mr Josser only had five hundred pounds altogether. He was now in an enlarged dream state in which he'd bought everything that took his fancy, thatched, Elizabethan, Cotswold stone, brick-built, ivy-covered, Queen Anne, it, it made no difference. For the past half an hour, he'd been living in Essex, in Hertfordshire, in Middlesex, in Bucks, in Kent and in Surrey. Glancing up, he saw Mrs Josser regarding him and rather self-consciously he tried to conceal what he'd been reading, but 
He needn't have troubled. Mrs Josser wasn't thinking about cottages. If Doris was so unhappy here that she wanted to leave home, why didn't she say so? she demanded. I shouldn't have stopped her. But that's just what she's done, Mr Josser answered. She said she wants to go. It's no use now, Mrs Josser replied scornfully. She ought to have said that before. When? When she first thought of it. But she hadn't got anywhere to go. Well, she was planning, wasn't she? It was no good. They'd been over it all before. Mrs Josser was offended, bitterly offended. She found it difficult to forgive her daughter for this piece of family treachery. It soured it's, it, sorry, it, sa it savoured of everything that was scheming, underhand and deceitful. She drew in her lip as she thought about it. If she goes, she said suddenly, I'm going to find a PG. I'm not going to leave the room upstairs standing empty. As Mr Josser didn't appear to be inclined to go on with the conversation, Mr Josser returned to the home finder. Of course, if you were prepared to go as far away as Cumberland, there were waterfalls and uninterrupted, uninterrupted views of magnificent unspoiled mountain scenery. Uh, bus service one mile. It had to be simply there for the taking. It's my belief she was influenced, Mrs Josser said suddenly. You mean, Mr Josser began. Mrs Josser nodded. I mean that Doreen person, she said. She's at the bottom of it. She's the one I'd like to talk to. But then w why not? Mr Josser asked innocently. Get Doris to bring her here. Have her here? Mrs Josser answered. Not likely. She's done enough harm already, hasn't she? Then how are you going to talk to her? I'm not. I'd only like to. Mr Josser went silent again. You know, Mother, he said at last, it isn't everything... It, it isn't anything very serious she wants to do. Plenty of other girls have done it. She only wants to leave home. Only, Mrs Josser repeated, raising her eyebrows a little. Well, you'd have left home yourself if you'd had a chance, wouldn't you? Mr Josser asked. You've often said so. Mrs Josser turned on him. To throw the past up in her face in this fashion was intolerable, so she denied it. What, me, leave home? she asked. Never. With that, she got up and went round the room tidying. A tidying, particularly tidying of this kind, was always an indication that she was badly upset. She jerked the corner of the heart rug straight, thumbed up the cushions and rearranged the ornaments on the mantelpiece. Mr Josser sat watching her. There's one thing, Mother, he said. In a way, it, it makes it easier not having to consider Doris. You were against making the journey, remember? If we only have ourselves to consider, we could have a cottage anywhere. And leave Doris with that Doreen person? Mrs Josser replied over her shoulder. Not likely. If Doris goes, we let her room and we stop where we are. Oh dear. Oh dear, oh dear. Sorry about my phone pinging. Move it over there. Percy was flat on his back underneath a car thinking about Doris. This is love he kept telling himself. This is the real thing. This isn't just something passing. This one hurts. This is the real thing. He removed the last nut and the silencer fell down on him, splattering bits of dried mud and rusted metal into his eyes and hair. He could hear the burnt-out baffle plates rattling about against each other. Oh, this'll be a spot welding job, he told himself. As he worked his way out from under the chassis, he was still thinking about Doris. She's different, he began all over again. She doesn't know anything. No one's woke her up yet. She's never been kissed. She's just an ice queen. And then 
as though defending her. But that's because she's a kid. She's got a heart, all right, only it's hidden. She's afraid of love. She needs teaching. Someone's got to show her. It wasn't any use leaving the silencer there on the ground, and Percy went through into the workshop with it. He'd have to write out a repair ticket. As he went, he sang... Li oh, now, I don't know the tune to this. Little girl blue, it is a ghost or is it you that haunts my dreams that never come true? Little girl blue, it is a moth on my lips, I feel. Every night in the darkness, something real. Little girl blue. Anybody know that tune? Anybody know that song? Be nice to know what that is. A lump came to his throat as he thought about the words. That was him, all right. It was a night... That it, it was at night that it got him most. Late at night, two in the morning, that sort of thing. I'll give her chocolates in round boxes. I'll buy her a hundred state express. I'll take her to the photo... I'll take her to get her photo done. I'll show her where life begins, he went on to himself. She'll wake up and think she's still dreaming. She'll think Father Christmas did it. She's just Cinderella. She's just never been kissed. Never been kissed. Something hot and uncontrollable ran through him, and he wanted her. I'll kill any man who got her first, he said aloud in, an, in the empty workshop, with the motor tyres and the head, headlamp bulbs and the cheap accessories all around him. I'll kill anyone who looks at Doris. He wrote out the repair ticket and went upstairs again. It was his last job, and when he'd finished, he was through. He didn't intend to take too long over it, either. Perhaps I'll meet her on the stairs as I go in, the thought struck him. Perhaps I'll be close to her. Perhaps she'll say something that, to show she cares. Perhaps I'll meet her on, on the stairs as I go in. Then he had a new idea. He'd got the end of the silencer off by now and had taken a look inside. Two new baffle plates would make it OK again. It would last for years then, last as long as the car, but they'd have to do a bit of spot welding, and that would take all the time, his time. What was the big idea behind it anyway? He wouldn't make anything out of it, it was just his job, nothing on the side, no commission, someone must think he was a sucker, or, or was he? Picking up a monkey wrench, he did a bit of work inside the silencer and held it up to the light. The light came shining through in places and he, wi and he widened one of the places with his thumb. Then he put up the silencer on the bench as evidence. Bung on a new silencer in five minutes, he said. It's sweated labour anyhow. It was eleven o'clock when he left the garage. Outside the public house, houses, groups of people were standing as though, having spent the rest of the evening together, they could not bear to part so abruptly now. But elsewhere the streets were deserted. There were stretches of a hundred yards or so without anyone in sight. Kennington, in fact, had put itself to bed, leaving Percy, one of the world's workers, without anything to do. He thought for a moment of the all-night cafe in Brixton, but it seemed a long way to go simply on the off chance of meeting someone. And it wasn't adventure. It wasn't adventure that he was wanting tonight. It was Doris. Anyhow, Mum will be pleased to have me home early for once, he told himself. So he crossed over and stood waiting for a bus. He was still humming Little Girl Blue and he felt in a romantic, exalted sort of mood. He wanted to go upstairs on a rainbow and dream. Then suddenly the mood changed and he began feeling feverish through, feverishly through all his pockets. He was afraid he'd run clean out of cigarettes and all the bloody shops shut. But he was OK. He got a packet of 20. Not started. He'd just recovered from the anxiety and was back upstairs on the rainbow again when a voice greeted him. Hello, Purse, the voice said. I hoped it was you. He was aware of a strong waft of perfume as he turned, a mixture of shampoo and cashew and scent and fancy toilet soap. 
He knew before he saw her that it was the blonde from the fun fair. Hello, he said unenthusiastically. I was horrid to you the other night, the blonde said. I've been sorry ever since I teased you. Teased me, Percy repeated coldly. Did you? Don't you remember? Her voice was husky and she tried undecidedly... Sorry, she, her voice was husky and she seemed undecided whether to be relieved or, or offended that he hadn't remembered. Can't say I do. She came nearer to him. You know, about me being married. Oh, that. He could feel her arm pressing against his and he told himself that she could save herself the trouble because, because of Doris, neither this blonde or any other had any meaning for him. He could have found himself on a desert island full of blondes and he still wouldn't have cared. Uh, it doesn't matter, he said loftily. It doesn't matter in the least. The blonde drew in, drew her breath quickly. Well, in that case, it doesn't matter to me either, she said. I only thought perhaps it might. Percy wasn't even looking at her now. He was looking down Brixton Road and he saw what he wanted. Excuse me, he said. There's my bus. He pulled his hat down a little more firmly over one eye and stepped into the gutter with his arm raised. He liked getting on a bus that way, simply slowing it down a bit and then jumping on as it was going. It showed you you knew your way about. Good night, Purse, the blonde said, and there was a, a little break in her voice as she said it. I'm sorry I spoke to you. I, I didn't understand. That's OK, Percy answered and made the mistake of looking back. If he hadn't have looked back, he wouldn't have known that she was in tears. And then he would have been on the bus all right, instead of simply looking after its red tail light vanishing down the long street. But for as long as he could remember, he'd always been weak on tears. They got him right there, and he couldn't stand up to them. So he let the, pass, he said he let the bus go by, and asked her what was the matter. She was only a little thing, about Doris's size, and already he felt sorry for her. He couldn't help feeling sorry when women cried because of him. But the blonde was already perking up a bit. I, I didn't mean to start crying, she said. I don't like girls who cry. It's only that you were so cold, I, I couldn't help it. Percy remembered the bus again. Well, what's the trouble? he asked. I haven't done anything, have I? Only to my dreams, she said, more like her old self. That's all you've done. She took hold of his arm and pushed it through hers. I can't make you out, she said. Honest, I can't. You're so funny, I reckon you must be afraid of me. You didn't seem to be the other night, and, and now you are again. Percy looked down at her. He was right. She wasn't bad looking, and she'd had her hair, and she'd had her hair brightened up again. She was almost a real blonde now. Why should I be afraid? He said defiantly. You shouldn't, the blonde answered, brightening up again. Come and buy me a cup of coffee, and I'll tell you all about myself. There was a small coffee stall opposite the oval, and they went towards it. After the cold, deserted expanse of the Brixton Road, it was like stepping suddenly into a farmhouse kitchen. The tea urn sparkled like a fireman's helmet and reflected the pile of ham sandwiches and the thick slabs of fruit cake and the coconut macaroons. They both had two cups of uh, they both had two cups and hot meat pies apiece. And then, because the coffee stall was crowded, they crossed into a neighbouring doorway where everything was private. Put your arms around me, the blonde said. I'm cold. He did so. And, he, and held her pressed up close to him. He kept on pretending that it was Doris whom he was holding. You do believe me, don't you? She said anxiously. I believe you. I only said that I was married, you know, just to tease you, she said. Honest, I did. OK, Percy told her. Don't go on about it. Well, kiss me, just to show we're friends. It was the blonde who prolonged the kiss... It was her kiss, in fact. But Percy got something out of it, all right. Towards the end, it was OK. 
so far as he was concerned as well. And then the blonde told him what she had and then the blonde told him what she had brought him there to tell. Don't let's hang about here, she said in a whisper. What's wrong with my flat? OK, Percy said, hoarsely. It was no use pretending about Doris any more. It was one thirty a.m. and the streets were quiet and the streets were quite empty now. Cherry Street, where the blonde lived, was simply a blank brick chasm with lamp posts down it. And the Brixton Road itself was a dead water courage sorry, was a dead water course with the glitter of tram rails under the moon where the river should have been. Coming down the Brixton Road was a man. It was it. He was the only living thing in sight, and he was hurrying, darting like a fox in a desert. If I had if I had a girl like Doris, he was saying under his breath, I'd give I'd give over mucking about. I'd get a house in Put Pearly Way with a garage. I'd have friends in the evening. Mrs Boone had lain awake for him. That you, Percy? she called out. Yeah, it's me, Mum, he answered, with his fingers on the handle of the door. Do you want a cup of tea or anything? No, thanks, Mum. Come and kiss me good night. Come in, Mum. And there we are at the end of chapter, whatever that was, ten. We're really, really getting the characters now. Let's just have a moment, to, give me a moment to, to, uh, off for a second. Um... Andrew Norris is, has arrived. Hello. Still pruning the apple trees. Marvellous stuff. Um, Lee Lawson says, Little Girl Boo was written by Richard Rogers in 1935, introduced by Gloria Grafton in the Broadway music Jumbo. A song with the same title is on YouTube. Janis Joplin and Nina Simone. Don't know if it's the same one. Oh. Um, Audrey Forbes says, remember when you could jump on and off the moving buses? Oh, yeah, they were the days. Billabong O'Neill says, yes, Audrey, always remember to put your feet down, your left foot down. Um, I love those old bosses, says Michael White. It was, a, it, was on a, it was great on a cold day, stepping inside. They had a real comforting smell about them. Audrey Forbes says, and thick fog upstairs. Yeah, that's true. All Woodbines and Park Drives, says Billabong O'Neill. Cheers, everybody. We're on chapter 11. I hope you're still enjoying the book and enjoying the characters. It had been arranged. Doreen was coming and Dulcimer Street was getting ready for her. It was already after tea time and Mr Josser was standing in front of the little mirror in the kitchen, shaving. This was one of the little things that he had got slack about, shaving. Every morning, except Sundays, for nearly 40 years he had shaved hurriedly and uncomfortably while the early tea kettle was boiling. But now he was taking things a little more easily. Every day was a Sunday, in fact. He just potted about, reading the papers and getting in the way, until about the middle of the morning, and then borrowed a jug full of hot water whenever there was any going. Sometimes there wasn't any, and Mrs Josser told him that he should have asked for it earlier. But that didn't matter. There was no fixed time for it any more. The only way in which he was strict with himself was in looking spruce and respectable by the time that Doris got back. It was a point of honour not to do anything that would lower him in his daughter's eyes, least of all tonight. Not that he'd had her much longer. Not that he'd have her much longer. It was a sad business, but apparently she'd set her heart on the flat of hers. He couldn't blame her, he admitted. After all, it was her life, and if she preferred spending it in a half-converted attic in another part of London, there was nothing that could be done about it. He hoped that he'd had hoped, before Mrs Josser stepped in and stopped it, to attempt her with the offer of a cottage in the Chilterns with an old world garden and a good train at five to eight in the mornings. But that simply wasn't her way. Her mind was working. With her, it was the attic or nothing. 
He was only sorry that Mrs Josser was still taking it so badly. In her view, the whole plan remained a subtle and deliberate slight. He could see her in the corner of the mirror as he stood there shaving. It was no more than a small glimpse of her back and shoulders, but there was something unmistakably uncompromising about it. The hard line of the backbone radiated hostility to attics. Then, quite suddenly, Mrs Josser turned on him. And what's going to happen if either of them's ill? Who's going to look after her? Just tell me that. It was unfair, Mr Josser thought, that Mrs Josser should tax him with it just as if it had been his idea. He tried to pass it off smoothly, though. It'll work out all right, he told her. Well, things always do. Always do what? Mrs Josser demanded. Well, turn out for the best, he persisted. You see if they don't. Mrs Josser drew in her lip and declined to answer. This wasn't the first time that she'd been disappointed in him. It was like going to battle with someone who didn't care which way the fighting went. She glanced up nervously at the clock. You'd better get yourself dressed, she said. They'll be here any moment now. Mr Josser had finished shaving by now and he pulled out his own watch to satisfy himself. Oh, not yet, he said. It's, it isn't six yet. But, Miss, but Mrs Josser had already left him and he was simply talking to himself again. It had been like that all afternoon. Ever since lunchtime, Mrs Josser had been darting about things. First of all, she'd cleaned up all the papers and magazines. There were the home finders, mostly, from the table beside Mr Josser's chair and carried them mysteriously into the bedroom. Then she'd gone round swooping on things, even quite ordinary things that had a right to be there, like Mr Josser's carpet slippers and his pipes, and she'd carted those away too. By the time she'd finished, the room had a bleak, unaccustomed look. It was as though looters had been round the place. Mrs. Mr Josser put up his collar and tie and went on into the drawing room to see if he could help. On the way, he met Mrs Josser carrying the fern that had always stood on the window sill in the passage, but she put it where the papers and the magazines had been. "'What's that doing there?' Mr Josser asked. Nothing, Mrs Josser answered promptly. It's just that it, it looks bare without anything. But why bother just because Doreen's coming? It was a foolish, untactful question and it got Mrs Josser on the raw. Bother, she demanded. Who's bothering? She's got to take us as she finds us. I I'm not bothering. Then she caught the eye of Mr Josser's suit. And you need to imagine you're going to wear that, she told him. Mr Josser had, as a matter of fact, been wondering about it. It was the suit that he was very fond of. It was his favourite suit, in fact. But the trousers belonged to a different suit altogether. And it was apparently that that rankled Mrs Josser. What sort of people do you think Doreen will think we are? she asked. She isn't coming here, but she isn't coming here to see my trousers, Mr Josser objected. She's coming to see Doris, Mrs Josser refused to argue. She's coming here to meet me, she said tersely, and I'm relying on you. So, in the end, Mr Josser went through into the bedroom and changed. He put on his new black, the one that made him look like a mute. It looked, in fact, so funeral that when he saw himself in the mirror, that without being asked to, he changed his tie. The one he had chosen was a bright striped one that didn't, that he didn't often wear, and it certainly altered the whole effect. He still looked like a mute, but uh, a mute on holiday. <laughs> Sometimes Norman Collins catches me unaware, because by mute he means one of those at a funeral, um, you know, one of the, the, the mutes in a funeral... Um, Cortage. Is it cortage? Is that the word you use? They're just there, aren't they? A mute that's on holiday. <laughs> oh, I love it. The thing is, it's often very simple language, isn't it? It's just very simple language, but it conveys so very much. I love that line just now. 
just here. And you needn't imagine you're going to wear that. You can sort of hear that from a mother like fan. You needn't imagine you're going to wear that. What? What do you mean, mother? <laughs> you go and change immediately. <laughs> but they're not coming to see me. <laughs> Never mind all that. You go and do as I tell you. <sighs> dear, oh dear. When he'd redressed himself, he went down on all fours and dragged out his carpet slippers from underneath the chest of drawers where Mrs Josser had hidden them. They were loose and comfortable and they seemed to make the whole evening easier. He was in a good temper again when he returned to the front room. Having given way, he had the grafted, indulgent feeling of a man who has done something to please a woman, even though he knows that it is silly. He almost expected to be thanked for remembering to change his tie, but it was all the more hurtful, therefore, when Mrs Josser wouldn't allow him to wear his slippers. But she was adamant about it. Apparently, between the best people and Mr Josser, slippers was a gulf that was unbridgeable. Mr Josser said nothing and, thoughtfully, put on his boots again. I love that. I love that. There's a gulf between the best people and Mr Josser. There is a gulf that is unbridgeable. That is just beautiful. Mrs Josser followed him into the bedroom and then asked him to leave her there for the next ten minutes while she slipped something on. She made it quite clear, however, that there wasn't going to be any dressing up on her part. From the way she spoke to Mrs Josser had been... Sorry, from the way she spoke, Mr Josser had been pestering her to change. "'It's all right for you,' she said over her shoulder as he went out. "'You haven't got to do the dishing up. "'I'm not going to spoil my best frock to please anyone.' In the end, she was rather longer than ten minutes and Mr Josser, without his home finder, was left with nothing to do. He lit a pipe and went moodily over to the window, staring out into the street. But it was more... But it was more than Doreen troubling him, a great deal more. It was his forthcoming speech on foreign policy. So far, he'd managed to get through the present session without doing more than express the government's misguidings over the fact that Hitler should have decided to cross the Czechoslovakian frontier and set up a protectorate, a protectorate there. It had been a carefully guarded speech because he hadn't known at the time that Mr. Cham what Mr. Sorry, he hadn't known at the time that Mr. Chamberlain was going to be so out outspoken over Westminster the very next day and openly accused the Fuhrer of breaking his word. This was a side, the angry, indignant side of Mr Chamberlain's nature, that he hadn't met before, and it warmed his heart towards him. All the same, matters had been steadily going from bad to worse since then, and it seemed that perhaps Mr Chamberlain hadn't used that tone of voice soon enough. The climax came when Germany refused to accept the British note of protest and at this point, Mr. Josser's, to Mr Josser's relief, Mr Plumcroft decided to take over in the House. In the result, Mr Plumcroft made the best speech of his career. From the front bench, he had, sp from the brunt front bench, he had spread peace and tranquillity over the agitated assembly like an ointment. He was as calm as he was confident, and it nearly broke Mr Joss's heart a couple of days later when Hitler, who apparently, uh, who evidently missed Mr Plumcroft, had been, what Mr Plumcroft had been saying, demanded Memel and got it. I'm not sure what Memel is. He'd already got the opening sentence of his address pretty clear in his mind when Mrs Josser came back into the room. She was wearing her afternoon frock, with the sleeves that were a shade too tight, and she had pinned on a cameo brooch that she hadn't worn for years. Mr Josser regarded her for a moment. "'I thought you said you weren't going to wear that dress,' he remarked. Mrs Josser turned on him. "'And why shouldn't I wear it if I want to wear it?' she demanded. It was Mr Josser's second mistake already that evening, and he wanted to do something to make amends for it. He asked Mrs Josser if there was anything that he could do to help, but it made no amends at all. It only aggravated her. 
I don't know what's the matter with you this evening, she said. You aren't usually like this. Why don't you sit down and read something? Mr Josser sat down, but since there was nothing to read, he sat down, he sat there picking absent-mindedly at, at a loose place in the upholstery, thinking about his speech. Mrs Josser sat opposite him and began to sew. At 6.30, Mr Josser's clock struck and Mrs Josser started. That clock makes me jump, she said. I'm sure there's something wrong with it. Nobody could have meant a clock to be as loud as that. Oh, I'm so sorry, my volume suddenly went really loud and distorted. I do apologise. I must have knocked the knob. Sorry about that. Um, how are we doing? Time's ticking on. I'm sure there's something wrong with it. Nobody should have meant a clock to be that loud. Mr Josser looked up in astonishment. I, I thought it sounded just about right, he said. There was silence between them after that. Quarter to seven struck, and then seven. And each time Mrs Josser looked up, though as if the clock had hit her one. It was not until quarter past, however, that she actually spoke. She let the boom die away and said a trifle anxiously, I hope nothing's happened to them. Sorry about that. Yes, uh, Julius, uh, Linda Kane says, uh, Memel refers to northernmost part of the German province of East Prussia as defended by the Treaty of Versailles, apparently. Ah, right. Julia says, I thought it was me. I had to turn the volume down. Sorry about that. Um, there was silence before. I called her, oh yeah, blah, blah, blah. She let the boom die away and said a, a trifle anxiously, I hope nothing's happened to them. That was all she said, and she didn't speak again until the next quarter hour. This time, a note of anxiety in her voice had increased notably, but there was something else as well. This time there was an unconcealed jumpiness. It, it, it was tonight, Doris said, wasn't it? She said. Mr Josser thought for a moment. Uh, well, either tonight or Tuesday, he said at length. I, I don't really remember. He paused. But even if Doreen isn't coming, he said, where's Doris? She didn't say she was stopping out, did she? she better not with all that ham and tongue, Mrs Josser replied, and went on with her sewing. At quarter to eight, she could endure things no longer. She glared at the clock, waiting for it to strike, and when it had done so, she turned to Mr Josser again. If they're not here in a moment, she said, we'll start. We don't catch, you don't catch me waiting for anyone. Well, give them till eight, Mr Josser said. No point getting two meals in one evening. There aren't going to be two meals, she said briefly. When we've had what we're going to have, the table will be cleared. Then, at eight o'clock, at eight o'clock, everything happened at once. The clock struck, Mrs Josser sprang to her feet, and Doreen and Doris came in together. Mr Josser smiled indulgently. Ah, oh, there you are, he said. I knew you'd be here by eight. Mrs Josser smoothed down her dress and went on to the landing to meet them. As she did so, she sniffed, but it was nothing from the kitchen that she could smell. It was something going on upstairs in Mr Puddy's gas ring, and Mr Puddy was in charge of that smell. He'd been cooking himself a nice piece of cod when the fat had caught. The staircase was now full of dense blue smoke, and Doreen and Doris came upstairs, their eyes streaming. Mrs Josser had already decided that the ladylike thing would be to ignore it. She was holding out her hand in readiness when Mr Josser's voice came through from the front room. There's something burning, Mother, he said. It must have caught while we're waiting. And Doris didn't make it any better either. Good gracious, she said. What a smell. We haven't got to eat it, Mother. Uh, uh, this is Doreen. Pleased to meet you said Mrs Josser, studying her hand. "'How'd you do?' said Dorin. Doris. They went into the front room, into which blue tendrils of Mr Puddy's cod were already penetrating, and Doris introduced her father. "'Pleased to meet you,' said Mr Josser. 
do how do you do? said Doris. Sorry if I've um, made oh s- s- said Doreen. Sorry if I've made Doris late, Doreen said, a sudden apologetic rush, as though she had noticed the coldness somewhere. We uh, we had a most hectic time together getting here. Uh, are you late? Mr Josser said politely. We were just sitting talking and didn't really notice. Mrs Josser caught the eye as he said that and Mr Josser looked down at his feet again. Well, I expect you're ready for a meal now that you're here, Mrs Josser observed. I must do my face first, Doreen said. I must look a perfect fright. Uh, Take her along, Doris, said Mrs Josser. It'll be ready when you get back. As soon as the door was shut, Mr. Josser tur- Mrs. Josser turned to her husband. I've met her type before, she said. She didn't say where, and nor did she say what the type was. It was apparently sufficient that it should be, at once, a type uh, that was familiar. She's a nice-looking girl, isn't she? Mr. Josser observed. A bit older than Doreen, I would say. Uh, than Doris, I would say. It was some time before they returned, but apparently the wait had given Doreen an appetite. She refused the ham altogether and took only a small section of the bottled tongue. Mrs Josser apologised for the potatoes which had boiled themselves into a paste but Doreen said that uh, she didn't matter uh, because she didn't dare eat potatoes. They made her fat and she was just the weeny bit. She would only like the weeniest bit of bread instead. Do you eat potatoes? Mr Josser said in an indulgent sort of way. A big girl like you needs building up a bit. Please don't call me a big girl, Doreen exclaimed. It makes me feel absolutely enormous. I don't see why, Mr Josser answered. We can't all be the same size. Doreen did not attempt to reply, but she got a curious impression that the light was going out. Fine, gradually at first, but rapidly quickening up, the darkness was descending. It was already dusk in the room. Mrs Josser was the first to speak. She turned to Mr Josser. Didn't you do what I asked you? She said coldly. Mr Josser shook his head. "Um, I forgot, he said. Well, do it now, she told him. Mr Josser thrust his hand into his pockets, one by one, uh, but they were empty. Oh, it's in my other suit, he explained. By the time he'd left them, the little party at the at the table were almost in total gloom. Only Doreen's white silk blouse could be seen gleaming in the firelight. And in the darkness, they gave up eating altogether. They just sat there, wondering. Then, with the rattle of silver on the landing, the light shot up again and Mr Josser came back rubbing his hands. "'Where was Moses?' he asked pleasantly. After the interruption, they ate for some minutes in silence. The going down of the light seemed temporarily to have damped everything and and all their spirits, and Doreen appeared frankly sceptical about the whole affair. She kept glancing up at the red-shaded chandelier again. It was obvious that she wanted to know where things were in case the light should go out again. When they'd all finished, Mrs Josser looked round the table. "'Will anyone have some ham?' she said pointedly. Oh, I couldn't really, Doreen answered, not after what Mr Josser said about me being huge already. You could leave the fat, Mr Josser replied, but Doreen was not tempted and Mrs Josser turned to Doris. Bring in the jelly, she said. It's in the kitchen with the pineapple. Don't forget the cream. To Doris... My goodness, this goes on. This goes on quite a bit, so we'd better we'd better finish. Um, how are we doing? We might as well finish here. Don't forget, because I'm reading a bit rubbish. Um, so they're sitting having their dinner, and they're about to have pudding. I think we'll leave it there, because uh, there's no immediate break. I think this evening is uh, an important evening. So uh, we'll leave it there, if that's all right, until tomorrow, which is Friday. Go and get the jelly. And the cream. Oh, dear, potatoes make me fart, says Nigel Sadler, do they? Uh, Hello. Uh, Sorry I'm late. I've only just uh, been a member of the audience for tomorrow's Now Show. I've only just been a member of tomorrow's Now. Oh, fair enough. Virtual cake, no weight gained. 
with Richard you can have cake and eat it. Absolutely. I need to cut back having so many crisps. Uh, sorry, Richard, we've been talking cake while listening. Oh, well, not to worry. Um, we'll pick up the story tomorrow and see if anything else happens. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching. Hope you've enjoyed it, and I will catch up with you and on. Until then, take care one and all. Um, I will catch up with you then. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>